Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome and thank you for joining us at our first Launchpad Academy, Building Your Best Entrepreneurship Program. We're excited to say we have over 130 participants registered for today from over 90 universities across the country. Today, we have three very seasoned guests, instructors Jim Hornthal and Todd Morrill, who have collectively taught over 50 cohorts all over the U.S. and in as far off places as Senegal, South Africa, and Kuwait. We also have Melissa Sang, who is a former student and teaching assistant of Steve Blank, who will be sharing her insights as well. Today, we will be covering the basics of how to start a lean program, selecting teams and setting expectations, but also managing the customer discovery process and what to expect from your cohort. We'll wrap up with some big picture questions and some resources to take home with you. Before we get started, let's let our guests quickly introduce themselves. Jim? Hi, um, as stated, I'm Jim Hornthal. I have been working on the Lean Launchpad methodology since, um, gosh, I want to say 2010, uh, when we began our first journey and uh, continued to be a survivor. So, um, in fact, there is life after Lean Launchpad. Excellent. Todd? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Todd Morrill. Um, I am the faculty director for the Bay Area Node of the NSF i which probably doesn't mean much to everybody, but I teach the lean methodology. I use, um, I've been teaching it for three or four years and I've taught a relatively large number of courses to teams from biomedicine, technology, community-based teams, uh, small business administration t teams, et cetera, as well as participated in the various educators courses for the methodology over the last uh, four or five years. Thank you. And Melissa. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa, and I was first introduced to Lean Launchpad just about a year ago um, when I was a team member at the UC Berkeley MBA program. Um, shortly after, I also worked with Steve Blank to launch the first um, School of Engineering at Berkeley cohort, which started last fall and will be taking place again this fall. Excellent. And I'm Kira. I'm the Director of Academic and Government Relations here at Launchpad Central. Um, I was first introduced to the methodology in 2012 um, at UCSF through the Lean Launchpad for Healthcare and Life Sciences. So great. Thank you all for being here. Um, Todd, let's go ahead and start with you. Why do you think so many entrepreneurship programs are switching from traditional business plan courses to Lean methodology? Um, because the lean methodology actually works. So I taught at UC Berkeley's High School of Business. I taught the basic entrepreneurship course and a couple specialized courses about 10 years ago. I taught it for seven years. And business plans um, spent a lot of time, spent a lot of effort. Business plans were very cool. You know, they had charts and graphs and interactive spreadsheets and all kinds of nifty stuff. And, um, you know, at the end of the course, you handed in this giant document, and the professor, in my case, me, I had to read through all those things, and sometimes you read them carefully, and sometimes you didn't. It was a great exercise. It had nothing to do with entrepreneurship. It had nothing to do with the learnings you need to start a company. And what the Lean methodology does is in, you know, a short period of time, depending on the course, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks. Um, we teach 8 weeks instead of our standard one eight weeks, the teams come out with a really good idea of what they need to do to make their company successful. And that's just wildly different than the traditional entrepreneurial curriculum, which is very academically oriented and kind of checks a lot of boxes, but doesn't actually create results. Yeah, um, echoing Todd's comment, I'd say that my personal bias has come that business be taught in the English department under creative writing and fiction, because it's some of the most hysterical things you've ever read. But with Todd, it has very little relationship to what goes on in the real world. And I think the immersion that the Launchpad approach provides students is a very rich and provocative experience for them beyond the team experience of the class. Great. Thank you. So, Jim, um, pulling from our audience, it seems about half of our programs recruit their teams before the course and at the other half form teams during our course. What do you look for in teams? Um, are you looking for a great idea or a nimble team? What would you say is the DNA of a really great team? Sure. 
Um, so I've, I've taught the course to commercial professionals, postdocs, grad students, and undergraduates at Princeton. And when Steve and I started teaching the course at Berkeley, we actually thought we were trying to pick projects that would be successful. And we quickly realized that since no, no team ends up where they start, to believe that the project was an indication of the opportunity was our mistake. So what we've come to believe is that the teams that do the best are the teams that bring um, thick skin because this is a very quick feedback platform. So we don't have a lot of time for lovely compliments, although when they're warranted, they're given. Uh, round heels, the willingness to really move away from something you once hold dear and true to your heart when evidence suggests it's not. And also diversity. And the diversity part, I can't overemphasize enough. And diversity is putting together liberal arts students with engineers, um, MBAs with biology majors, and um, every form of diversity, whether it's gender, ethnic, background, because what we're dealing with is a pattern acquisition process, and we're relying on the teams to provide pattern recognition skills. And the more different filters and backgrounds brought to a problem, the richer and the higher the likelihood of a good uh, change, positive change from the data. So I'd say those are the three things uh, to look for the most, thick skin, round heels, and diversity. Thank you, Jim. Todd, what do you consider to be the most valuable lessons to instill in your students during the beginning of the course? How do you set those expectations before the course starts? Um, I guess it depends a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. I guess it depends a little bit on the course, depends a little bit on the student, well, who the students are coming in. Um, but if I had to pick a couple of universals, I'd echo what Jim said, and that is when, it, when run properly, this course is pretty direct. It's pretty fast-paced. And so we set expectation, expectations with the teams that they should expect to be challenged on a regular basis. And I don't mean challenged in the sense that two days later you write them a response. I mean, while they're saying it, somebody interrupts them and says, why do you think that? Or explain to me the data that supports that. So real-time feedback. Um, it's important to set that expectation because it's a little bit of a shock, quite honestly, to a lot of teams in, in all environments. And like Jim, I've taught everything from the undergraduate to the, to the corporate world, and everybody is a little bit taken aback. You set the expectation up front, and they get with the program. And frankly, within a couple of iterations, they get it, and they love it. And, you know, it's a pain in the neck to have someone interrupt you, but they love the fact that they get real-time feedback and can, can uh, continue to refine what they're trying to do. Um, the other thing, the other expectation is it's hard work. It's a lot of work. You know, the, the, the standard phrase that lots of people use is we're simulating a startup, and it's not really as hard as the real world. It really isn't. Um, but it is more intense than your average, especially academic course, but, you know, average experience. Um, you have to think fast, you have to move fast, and you have to work really hard. And so, obviously, you know, the amount of work that goes in depends on the team, and it depends on the individual, and it really depends on the course structure. But for, uh, for many courses, each team is putting in 40 to 100 hours per week. And the teams are three people, right? Um, to, get, you know, to get all the materials in place and to understand what they're doing and talk to customers and so on. So at the galactic level, the, the two things that teams need to be aware of is, A, they're going to have to work like crazy, and B, they're going to they're get fairly direct feedback from the, uh, from the instructors of the course. Excellent. Thank you. Going back to you, Jim, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are that students face with customer discovery? A lot of educators ask about how to incentivize students to do the interviews. What kind of tactics have you found to be effective? <clears throat> so I guess if part of the question is really twofold, is teaching what a good interview is uh, and then motivating the students to do more of them. And the mistake a lot of teams make, uh, not only in academia but in enterprise, is they think they're selling something or trying to prove themselves right, when in fact they're trying to learn what the problem is, what the pain is, what the solution might look like. And once you've explained and have some examples from a class of what a good interview experience is like, 
Um, I've really not experienced the issue of getting them to do a lot of them. One of two things happens. Either the team catches fire and they can't stop doing them and or they're shamed into not doing enough because we have a pretty strict metric that if you have not done 10 interviews since the last class, you literally do not present. And it has to happen once. It only happens once. Mm -hmm. It only happens once in a cohort where one team, one sad team is shamed. But the point is it's serious that in order to learn enough to tell us what you've learned, you had to have gone out of the building enough to believe that what you come back with is new and insightful. So that's actually, that's big. Do you have to have that moment in every cohort where you ask one team to sit down because they haven't done the work? Yeah. So I think I've done this maybe a dozen or 15 times. I'd say it happens about half the time. Um, Steve Blank has uh, two rules. Rule number one is um, making an example of a team not doing the work is important. Rule number two is do not be that team. Um and, and it's a real question of personal style and how you do that. But it's kind of embarrassing when you think you're ready to give a presentation and you're not allowed to give it because you haven't done the core part of the work. And, you know, Todd, you have other experiences that may either complement or refute that. But I see that when needed and when deployed um, really turns uh, a team and sometimes a cohort around. Would you agree? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, it, and, and I agree with your ratio, too. It's not... Some cohorts just seem to get it and never becomes an issue. Others, you, you do have to kind of uh, discipline, for want of a better word, one team, and then everybody gets gets the idea. Melissa, did you want to add something? Yeah, so from the team member point of view, I think, you know, early on in the first few weeks, it's really easy to get your customer interview list going. You reach out to your networks, your friends, your family, whoever will help you. But I think as you start to get into week four and five, you realize that your network might be at its limit and you really have to find more resources to get these interviews. So I think a couple of helpful tips from the team member point of view is when your instructors and your mentors can you know, be open enough to share their contacts and resources with you. Um, obviously, the teams have to do the work in terms of figuring out the profile of the customers they want to interview before asking for this type of help. Um, when I was in the class, we also paired up with teams. So every week, different teams would pair with one another and kind of offer support and extend offers to in make introductions to have better customer interviews. So that was really helpful for us. Um, I think what's also really critical is, as Jim said, to really maintain and upkeep that number of interviews. Um, it's an arduous process, but doing the work really results in um, more effective progress towards your goal. Excellent. Um, Kira, if I can riff on that, that sure. will interrupt the flow. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, that Melissa actually brings up a really good point. Um, the network is important. Uh, there's some sort of fine-tuning I'm trying to get outside your network, but the network is important. Um, but really having, having reaching out as a team, reaching out to the broader, you know, support network, um, your instructors, your other, other teams in the cohort, as well as people beyond that, is really important. And one of the old sort of throwaway phrases, but it has some value, is entrepreneurship is a team sport. Um, to be successful as an entrepreneur at all, you probably need to network like crazy. And in, this course is really just a reflection of that. So, yeah, by all means, use your, your personal network. But as Melissa points out, it gets thin pretty quickly, and you're going to need to to reach out. It's one of the reasons that we have teams uh, find a mentor before the course as often as possible. Right. And I think, Todd, to your point, the, we use the word mentor in a very different way. I think most people on the call have a historically accurate view of the phrase, which is a generally older man or woman who's probably taking a personal interest in you, your career, your decisions, and as a sounding board. That's not what we mean. It's much more of a process coach uh, who knows what we're talking about in terms of creating experiments, challenging the evidence, um, suggesting who might be someone to talk to, and in the best case with domain expertise, may even offer introductions. So even though we both use the same word uh, in the cohort experience within the Lean Launchpad, it's a much more active, uh, almost a coach role than a traditional mentor definition might be. Excellent. Thank you. Melissa, let's turn to your perspective for a moment as a student. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your emotional state throughout the course and, and what it was like for you? How often did you take Xanax and how much Xanax <laughs> did you take? 
how many all-nighters? Well, we're recording this conversation. Can't divulge all of the secrets, but I will share some HIPAA. tips. <laughs> a HIPAA-compliant HIPAA answer, please. So, you know, at Berkeley Haas, the program's been going on for a while now. So I had the luxury of being able to ask people who had taken the course before, you know, really what to expect. And I think the general rule of thumb is set aside at least 15 to 20 hours a week um, to, de to dedicate to the course and this experience. And after going through it, I would say 10 to 15 to 20 is probably a minimum number. <laughs> um, looking back on my experience, I think I dedicated a lot more. Um, but through the experience, I think what's critical to note and, you know, Steve, was really great in pointing this out on the first day of class that going through Lean Launchpad is an emotional journey. And he had this wonderful diagram. It's kind of a chart that shows your the time on the horizontal axis and your emotions on the vertical axis. And you start, everyone starts with a great high. You have this amazing idea. You're super excited about it. And quickly in weeks two through four, you realize that all of your assumptions weren't necessarily true. And maybe you find out that there's some competitors in the area that you weren't aware of. And so your emotions kind of drop to a low. I think we call it the valley of despair. Um, fortunately, though, from my experience, we had really great mentors, a really encouraging instructing team that um, gave us the tools to really come out of that and realize that through pivoting, having round heels, as Jim said, um, you really come out of it stronger and better. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, Todd, speaking to this moment of the Valley of Despair um, that Melissa was just talking about, can you tell us a little bit about how you coach a team when they reach that point that they've been doing the interviews, they've been getting out there, and they realize that there is no there there, and they're sad and they don't know what to do? How do you, how do you jump in with that team? Um, boy, I'm not sure how to answer it. It, it depends a little bit on the team. Um, when they truly discover there's no there there, it's a pretty tough moment. Um, but I would suggest that that's a very small minority of the teams. And they may discover that there's no... So a lot of teams discover that there is nothing to what their original idea was. But during the customer interview process, they've turned up lots of alternatives. So the number of times that a team actually hits a brick wall, there is nowhere left to go, it's a blind alley, you're done, is, is pretty, pretty rare. I would say, and Jim, you can probably you comment, it's, maybe it's 1 in 10, but it's probably more like 1 in 20 teams really have nowhere to go. There are probably um, another half the teams that discover the original idea is really not even in the right direction, and they have to pivot, so they change direction. And my job there as an instructor is to help them get through that change, help them understand it's okay to say that your original idea isn't so great, but there's this other one over here that's pretty cool, or at least seems cool. You're going to go out and validate it. Jim. Um, yeah, it, well, yeah. sometimes it's a complete disaster, and I can think of a handful of situations where teams were either forced to or on their own volition did a complete restart. But sometimes they do it because as they get deeper into the analysis and realize it's not for everyone, it's a smaller segment with a smaller price point, the market size may be so tiny that they decide it's not worth the effort, even in an academic exercise. Um, so those are personal decisions. We're not telling you that a lifestyle business isn't a good business. If it is a lifestyle decision you make, it should at least be defended based on evidence and the same process. But we often see in the enterprise world um, a clear pivot into a market that turns out to be too small and a pivot later into a different value proposition technology and or segment that has the potential to be uh, a much larger target. So, so those tend to happen more often than, than the complete and total restarts. And Kira, if I may, I guess one galactic level comment is to a certain extent, my my job as an instructor is to help teams see that there is a problem and maybe see some alternatives. It's not my job to be their mom. Um, they need to figure it out. And quite honestly, you know, you talked about how you select for teams. Resiliency is a key thing because the good teams will say, boy, I hate this. Boy, I hate you. Boy, I hate, you know, whatever it is you have to do. And then pick themselves up and move on. The ones that kind of break down, I'm sorry, it's too bad, but better now than in the real world. 
Great answer. Thank you. Uh, Jim, during the course, what kind of metrics are you looking for? What do you think the role of the instructor is during, during the meet of the course? Um, so in a perfect world, the, the mentors are kind of the first line of defense. They're the, the deputies in the field. Um, at a very simple uh, level, it's enough interviews, first of all. You know, we're looking for at least 10 a week. Um, and, and some of the early warning signs that we can look at by the third or fourth week, if there have been no hypotheses invalidated, it becomes increasingly unlikely that they're getting a real signal. Um, I think we all have what some of our colleagues call happy ears. We want to believe that people like us. They think our product's great. And the confirmation bias can often lead to people unwilling to actually say, no, actually, they're not saying that. They're saying that they don't really like it. So if, if we don't see enough invalidated hypotheses at a certain point in time, either the hypothesis was too broad, the experiments were too generic, uh, and therefore the signals aren't reliable. And that's one thing where we try and get in early and intervene with mentors and with teams and the class itself and show good examples as well as bad examples so we can get people on a better path to more productive outcomes. And how has your experience... Apologies. Jim, how has your experience teaching the Lean Launchpad from the very early days to now changed? You've been teaching this course since... Um, the first team was inventing something called the wheel. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> It, it, it went around, went, went pretty well. Um, <laughs> it was well adopted. So when, when Steve pulled me into his uh, vector, Steve Blank at Berkeley, we had eight teams. Uh, everyone had a different WordPress blog. We would get emails every time a team recorded something, which meant eight teams, 10 interviews. We get 80 emails a week. We read at least a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, they had to put together their own canvas. And while they were all rectangles with nine boxes, they all kind of looked different. Um, but it was okay because they, Steve gave the lectures and I shared some of the responsibility and the slides were pretty standard. And we would spend about a half hour to 45 minutes every class giving the lecture for the next week so they know what to work on. And that took up a lot of valuable time. We also had a, um, we got to know the students. We had office hours, we'd see them. And the only goal of the instructor is ultimately at the end to give out a fair grade that reflects the learning. So we did it with Dropbox and WordPress, and eventually Steve wrote a book, uh, Startup Owner's Manual, which was very helpful. We used Alexander Osterwalder's book, Business Model Generation, and a bunch of links to various web articles and videos that I'm sure the audience has their own favorites. Uh, Randy Komazar's book, Getting to Plan B, was one of my personal favorites. But we didn't have to worry about scaling a platform we just had to worry about surviving a semester. And when the National Science Foundation came to Steve to co-create the i program, that was a different vision. That was 25 teams per cohort, uh, as many as four or 500 teams a year in what has now become seven nodes and 100 sites, massively scaling. And at that point, sitting down with Errol Arklich, who created the program at i at the NSF, it was a question of, building an operating system for innovation that could give him the metrics that he would need on the performance by node, by mentor, by instructor, by team to learn best practices, share best practices, and improve the performance of everyone in the ecosystem. So we were able to then take that tool created for the government and redeploy it in the classroom, and by doing so, make the classroom more effective. Uh, and frankly, it was because of one of the um, just because you have the slides doesn't mean you can give them. Uh, and I recall vividly that Steve was out of the country the week we were doing partnership and we were training the University of Michigan and the Georgia Tech faculty to begin doing their own cohorts. And I will protect the innocent and not name names, but one faculty member from one of those institutions had Steve's slides and was giving the lecture on partners. And there is a vivid point in the partner slide presentation giving an example of a complete disaster, like possibly the world's worst partnership that lost a billion dollars. 
And this person felt compelled to say in front of the 25 teams, 100 plus members, but there were some good things that came out of that partnership. At which point I rudely interrupted and said, no, actually, the only good thing that came out of that partnership was that it finally ended and went back to Steve and said, quality control is key. That got Steve on a path to create a series of videos that are on Udacity.com, free to the world. I think over 320,000 people have watched them. By having Steve in a box, not only did we make sure everyone got the same message, but the 45 minutes we'd spend in every classroom giving the slides, we could now use a flip classroom and allow that homework to be done on their own. And the one thing nice about Launchpad Central is it actually measures the viewing. So people can't come in and bluff that they've watched the video. When they watch it through the platform, every video and the percentage completion is recorded as a metric. Um, we used to only let the teaching team view that. We now make that a public viewed document so that they, their cohorts, their team members can shame each other into getting the work done. Thanks, Jim. Um, Melissa, moving to your experience as a, as a teaching assistant, what are your first lines of defense if, if a team is struggling? Great question. So as a TA, we have the luxury of using the Launchpad Central platform. As Jim mentioned, one of the very first things that we always would look for was, were the team members watching the videos? And the reason why this is so critical is it's really hard to do the work if you don't understand what work you should be doing. The lean methodology is new to a lot of people. And so these videos actually get the message across and help you set up the experiments that you have to run, the people that you should be talking to, and how to frame your questions for the set, for the week ahead. So the very first line of defense was, you know, watching that video count. Are people doing the work? And if they weren't, as a teaching assistant, we would intervene right away and, you know, ask, like, what's, what's going on? What's happening? So that really helped to keep students on track with the content of the course. Um, after that, through the platform, we were also able to see if people were logging their interviews. You know, are they completing the tenant interviews a week? Are they on track to deliver the presentation at the end of the week? And it was really clear to see when teams were falling behind. And sometimes students, I think, are scared to ask for help. So as a teaching assistant, you kind of are monitoring this progress through the platform. And when you see this lag happening, it gives you the opportunity to intervene and ask, you know, do you need an introduction to someone? How are your interviews going? And I think those kind of extra prods really help the students continue their progress. Um, I think the last thing I would say as a teaching assistant, which is super valuable, is to kind of stay as the connector between the teams and their communication between their mentors. So as Jim and Todd kind of mentioned, having a mentor is really important to this process. Um, just to make sure that teams are doing the work or on track, but are also getting the kind of one-on-one -on -one attention that they need outside of the classroom. And through Launchpad Central, you can actually document what kind of conversations are happening with teams and their mentors and seeing the areas that they're struggling in. So as a teaching assistant, you can bring these topics up to the instructors and the instructors can decide maybe this is a topic to kind of call out in the classroom in front of everyone and use some of that lecture time together to address. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Jim, running out, how often do you, so you, so you go through the interview process or teams are formed during the course and how often are the teams that you think that are going to be really good, how often are those actually the successful teams? <laughs> you mean how often are we right in guessing the grades? Yeah, how, how often are you right at guessing the grades? Um, let me answer that question, but add one thing onto what Melissa said that I think is important. We mentioned that the videos are available online and we use a flipped classroom, which is a phrase a lot of people have heard of. The other innovation in this course is what I refer to as an inverted lecture hall. Um, the teaching team or the faculty are typically in the back of the room. The presentations are actually made by the students. They're actually teaching us. And an important part of the syllabus, the way it's taught at Berkeley and Stanford, and when I taught it at Princeton and UCSF, was peer comments. Mm, so I, team you. number two is talking. Teams number one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are supposed to be listening, having their computers open, not doing email, but commenting on that team. The platform actually tracks the peer comments, counts them, and in theory, if there's eight teams, seven of them aren't yours, 
You should make seven comments a week for eight weeks. You should have 56 comments, and the comments shouldn't be nice logo. It should be something more substantive. But if you don't have 56 comments, then we start saying you're not doing the work. And it's another part of the feedback loop, like watching the videos that Melissa mentioned, is participating as a peer mm-hmm. in a cohort setting, which is what makes the cohort environment so wonderful. Uh, and part of team selection also, if you have the luxury of more than eight teams applying, I think last year at Berkeley, we started with 50 and wound up with 20 that came in for interviews. Um, we could easily pick a half, four, four teams we clearly thought would learn a lot and contribute a lot. There were a half a dozen that we thought would be far, far less likely to contribute. But at the end, we tried to balance the cohort with different industries, different technologies, different challenges, so that the learning would be maximized across the cohort. You know, we did not need eight food companies or eight women's fashion websites. And so we took some careful attention to the seventh and eighth team that we let in, not that they weren't as qualified as the ninth and tenth team that did not get in, but that they brought another sense of diversity, not within a team, but within a subject matter or an industry or a sector to maximize the learning for the class. Uh, In terms of how often we guess, uh, probably never. Um, But what we do see as you get into the cohort at the end, there are one or two that are really nailing it. They don't necessarily start that way. Uh, We had one team at Berkeley a few years ago that we thought was just failing miserably. And then they went up to Oregon for a weekend at a conference and were marinating in hundreds of experiments and interviews and came back and actually went from one of the worst teams to crushing it. Um, At the end, though, there's usually one or two that just don't quite get it. Either they were too busy to do the work, the team became dysfunctional, which, by the way, every cohort, I've seen no less than one team become highly dysfunctional, whether it's personalities, mentor, abandonment, or some other uh, personal trauma and tragedy in the lives. But it's the middle group that's the real challenge. You know, one or two, you clearly know nailed it. One or two, there's not much help. And then how much time and resource you can spend in the middle, in the course while there's still time to try and help them get over the hump. And that gets back to having really good mentors who are helping you identify the problems as early as you can and intervene uh, as effectively as you can. And I'd be curious, Todd, does that reflect some of your experience as well, or, or do you have a different take on that? No, I would agree. I would agree. Uh, so, Kira, you asked the question, you know, how often can you pick the winners? It depends when you're picking. At the end of the course, I think I can pick <laughs> a pretty good job. Yeah. I'm, I'm always good at the end telling you what the lottery numbers are. Right. After exactly. the um, At the beginning of the course, I, so it, it depends what you pick on. Um, if you try to pick on technology, my experience is it's a waste of time. You're wrong. I'm wrong all the time. And my other instructors, my co-instructors would say the same thing. Um, ideas which just don't really make any sense. You kind of scratch your head and go, geez, I, I don't know. Um, sometimes turn out to be great. Things that are absolutely rock solid and in all whatever metric you want to use, whether it's intellectual property or experience or smart, smart people or whatever, some of them turn out to be junk. So uh, at the front end, picking the technology doesn't work at all. Um, to a certain extent, you can pick the teams, but that's only if you know the people, and often, of course, you don't. Um, at, the, at the middle of the course, the, the way I put it is that this is not a regurgitation exercise. So what is not rewarded in this process is people who are very good at assimilating written information and either spewing it back directly as is or reformulating and spewing it back. There are no tests. Or to put it another way, there's a test every week, but it has to do with what you have learned by talking to people and then mapping that onto the business model canvas and your idea, and conversely mapping your idea onto the customers you're talking to. So to be honest, you get a lot of surprises. I mean, there's some teams that start out strong and are strong the whole time. There's some teams that fade and don't end up anywhere near what you thought they were going to do. And conversely, there are lots of teams that struggle until some point, and at some point, apparently, They have accumulated enough information and processed enough that they now get what they're supposed to do. And they come roaring out of left field, you know, the seventh week of an eight-week course. And suddenly you go, holy Toledo, what happened to these people? Because they're not at the head of the class. Um, So it's really just sort of a whatever it took them to process internally. But the short answer to your question is I can kind of pick them at the end, but before then it's hopeless. And the other nuance I'll add to that is within a team – we ask every team member 
after the course to, sub, to allocate 100 points among the team. And I can tell you now in six years at Berkeley, there's not one team where everyone got the same grade. So there was a lot of team effort, but it could well be that one or two individuals are carrying the weight and they know it. And we've seen a pretty broad range within a team, within a high performing team, doesn't mean everybody gets an A. There could be you know, two A's, an A minus and a B minus. So that's an important thing we learned over time is that all the weight would not be carried equally. Um, there are some teams that kind of agree it should be equally balanced. So I'll go back and say maybe 25% of the time, everyone agrees they all deserve the same grade. It tends to be a B or a B plus. Uh, but on the super rock star teams, there are one or two people that tend to really crush it. And we try and find a way to distinguish them in the ultimate final grading because we do grade on individuals. The same is true that you know, if I responded to all 57 peer comments and someone on my team only did 30, well, that's part of how we do our weighted average grading. And I think we have some default syllabuses and recommendations on how it's worked for us and it might work for others. Um, but there's no way to believe that everyone will do the same level of work and deserve the same grade. So in a cohort of eight, how many would you say are really strong? How many would you say are mediocre? And how many are really struggle throughout the course? Is that a question for me? Sure, yes. Um, so again, we, we grade on a curve and the curve <laughs> is imposed on us by the universities. Um, and I would look back at the most recent cohort and say, you know, there were two that clearly nailed it on a team basis. Um, there was one that couldn't find the clue phone to call for help. And the other five were just gradations and shades of improvement. And we had to decide whether we wanted to reward, you know, the most improved versus the most consistent. Um, but but it, it's kind of a two or three, you, you're really happy to have done the work. And in one case, we actually wanted to invest in their company in one of our earlier cohorts. And they built an amazing company out of what was originally just a school project. But, you know, that's, that's not why they're there. And that's not why we're there. But sometimes good things can still happen. Excellent. Um, Todd, let's move back to you. What are some tips and tricks that you now implement in the classroom that you've learned through trial and error over the years? Um, hmm. Tricks, tricks, tricks. Well, I don't know, like anything, if you do it enough, you begin to be able to anticipate what's coming. So I'm not sure that's a trick, but just the more you do it, the better you get at it. The first time is kind of rocky. You know, Jim used the example of somebody using the slides the wrong way. Um, my experience is that the more you're able to internalize this course as an instructor, um, the better off you are. Um, that's probably the case for anything, but, but the way I put it is that my processor barely runs fast enough for me to keep up with all of the things I need to be doing as an instructor in this course. Because when teams are presenting, I need to be listening to what they're saying, I need to be mapping that onto what they were supposed to have done, I need to be listening for the things they're not saying. I need to be writing notes for myself in Launchpad Central, for example, to you know to keep track of what's going on. I often need to be communicating with other people at the same time. So uh, the the more you do it, the better you get at it, and you know ultimately that's the the best way to the best path to success. Um, in terms of specifics, having someone to co-teach with you is a really big deal. It's just enormously helpful to have either a co-instructor or an adjunct instructor or even just a, you know, a super TA or somebody who can also listen at the same time and help along the way. So being part of a teaching team, even with only a couple teams, is just gigantically helpful. And you know, the bad news on that is it requires an extra person. The good news is almost always there's somebody who wants to do it. Um, uh, you know, someone who's been through the course, somebody's heard about the technique, and uh, at least in my experience, you can usually find someone who will do it, and um, even if it's only on an occasional basis, can be gigantically helpful. The, the only my, my trick is to teach with Todd, and then he gets to do all the work. I get to take all the credit. That would be my <laughs> Todd, you're going to become um, very popular after this webinar. <laughs> um, the only other thing, and this is actually one of the hardest things, is that um, Jim's used the word coaching. This is a coaching exercise. It is not a consulting exercise. And the, 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 the differentiation between those is that as an instructor, my job is not to supply answers. 
My job is to ask questions. That's really great. Now, sometimes I know the answer, and I'll ask a leading question. I'll point teams in the right way with my question. But I will not give them the answer. I will not say, no, you need to go talk to Joe Bloggs. I simply ask them questions that allow them to, to go in that direction. That's a really hard skill, especially as, an, as a professor, as an academic, as a, 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 you know, a teacher. Your, your goal is to get answers, and so you give a lot of answers. And this course is really kind of you know, flipped classroom. That's a sort of flipped psychology. The goal is to make them go dig it out themselves. Well, and I'll tell you, the one thing that's great if you live through the first class is you have eight experienced mentors, and whoever's willing to come and do it the second time and the third time, there's nothing better than mentors who've been through this before, who've seen the videos, who've worked with the team, who've seen what does and doesn't work. Because, you know, a, in my opinion, a perfect mentor will go over a team's presentation before it's given. Um, if not there live, we'll debrief what happened afterwards, help them think about the week ahead, and is available spending you know, more than an hour, maybe two hours a week, helping the team. Well, if they've done it once and liked it, they'll come back. They are such a valuable resource. Whoever he or she was that does that deserves a medal mm -hmm. because they really improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the process. They're really the first line of defense. Uh, Melissa, let's turn to your experience as a student of Lean Launchpad again. What are the lessons that Lean Launchpad, what, what did you leave with? What do you still use today? So many lessons. Where to start? Um, I think the most important lesson, and this one comes at you very early in the class, is the power of customer discovery. You know, a lot of people, especially in the MBA program, have wonderful ideas for businesses that they want to start and or the latest technology that they think is going to, you know, solve all the world's problems. And those are that's fair. You know, it's great. But the reality is, is it's a lot of these folks have never actually put these ideas or put a prototype in front of an actual customer or and received real feedback from a potential customer on these ideas. And I think what Lean Launchpad really forces you to do is to dive in and get that feedback early and often. So you're really in touch with the real mission and purpose of the value that you're trying to create. So that was really essential for me. Um, second, I would say, um, I think just going back to what Jim said, like having round heels. So I think from my observation of going through the course, the teams that really you know, thrived, not just survived, but thrived, um, had round heels and were willing to pivot. Um, the teams that really struggled were the ones who thought that their initial idea was their baby and it couldn't be seen as ugly or different. You know, they just would not abandon those initial concepts. And the teams that really thrive are the ones that are flexible enough to shift and pivot when something is not working. And I think the course really taught me the value of being open to possibility. <clears throat> and I guess the last great lesson that this course really instilled in me was what it really takes to be an entrepreneur. So UC Berkeley, you know, we're really strong in entrepreneurship. We have case study competitions, a ton of innovation elective classes, and I took them all. But Lean Launchpad was the course that really taught me, showed me, had me feel <laughs> what it really, really takes to... <coughs> to be an entrepreneur. And I think it's it was an invaluable experience and I really wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, for anyone who's contemplating a career in entrepreneurship, you know, reading case studies on it is just not the same as going through an intensive experience like Lee Launchpad. Excellent. And can you tell us a little bit about your startup? Did you decide to take it forward? Did you end it at the end of the course? How did that work out? Yeah, it, this great question. Um, so we didn't see it through. We, after the course, we actually continued working on the project for a few months. We had actually signed on some pilot customers. But at the end of the day, what happened was I think some of the members of my team really realized that they were doing it as a course and not as a lifestyle. And again, just kind of going back to lessons learned, I think Lean Launchpad really kind of teaches you, you know, what it means to live the life of an entrepreneur. And the reality is, is it's not for everyone. 
So our team disbanded and, you know, it was sad at the moment, but I think for people who continue to pursue their ideas, you have to be 100% committed and be willing to make some really tough sacrifices to see it through. Um, a great kind of consolation prize for us, though, is a friend just reached out to me and said that a company just launched on Shark Tank that had a very similar idea and customer segment that they're serving. So I'm excited to see that there's a solution out there. Excellent. So Todd and Jim, I want to ask you about how you coach students through this moment of whether they're going to take a company forward or not, um, and how you deal with the notion of failure, particularly for students that are very high achieving at very good schools like Berkeley. Um, how do you help them make that kind of decision? Todd, let's go to you first. Uh, sorry, Todd, is that what you said? Yep. Yeah. So um, let's be careful with the word failure here. Um, I come from the biotech industry, biomedical industry. And the way I put it is that my industry is absolutely the industry. It's absolutely full of zombie companies. Companies which are dead, there's no reason for them to survive, but they stagger on, uh, eating the brains of the people who work inside them. Um, these are ideas which are going nowhere, but the company doesn't know enough to die. In, in, the, in, the, in the context of a course or a, a, a lean uh, immersion, um, if teams come to the conclusion that this is not a good idea and they can make a clean, no-go decision, that is brilliant. Now, it's sad. It's really sad to hear that your baby's ugly. But, boy, it's better than continuing on and sort of hoping that somehow lightning's going to strike or a venture capitalist is going to throw money at you or, you know, your grandma's going to give you $50,000 and, and then wasting it on something that's wasting your time and the money, on something that's not going to get anywhere. So the reason I'm, 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 I'm sort of screening on this, Kira, is that it's easy to see a no-go decision. We couldn't find anything that doesn't work as a failure. It's not a failure. It's a huge success, and we celebrate it in the course. We specifically call out teams who have the courage to say, boy, we looked and looked and looked, and we just can't find anything. And often they're some of the best teams, because it's a really tough lesson to, to internalize. Um, now, there's some teams, of course, that do find something that really makes sense. They find customers. They find a path through it. They find a business model canvas that makes sense, a business model that makes sense. And that's great. I mean, those, those you celebrate as well. The only teams that I would, that I am careful of, and that's the way to put it, is the ones who think that they're a success, and as Jim said, they just, they, they have happy years, they're unwilling to hear negative feedback, and those ones I just try to, to help them see what their customers seem to be saying. But again, I wouldn't call that a failure, I would call that a, a, a worrisome sign. So, short version, I, I don't, the only teams that fail are teams that decide not to take, the, not to participate. They don't do the interviews, they don't try very hard. And those ones, they're not very common, and when it happens, well, you know, you always get a couple dropouts in every group. Of, of, of. <clears throat> to, to paraphrase that, also, you know, we'll often give an A to a team that decided that it's a no-go, but they yeah, tell absolutely. us why. They thought it was this, it turned out it wasn't. When they looked at the next thing, the market was too small, they tried something different. And, you know, there's a great quote that Ted Turner gave, I think, after the Atlanta Braves spent 10 years in the basement as the worst team in baseball, and then they won the World Series, and a reporter asked Ted, how did it feel to, to fail all those years? And Ted's comment was he wasn't failing, he was just learning how to win. And realizing it's a class, and the experience is meant to be uh, learning and knowledge acquisition, I'd say that anyone who came to the class and did the work is better prepared to win in whatever job challenge they find themselves in, whether it's entrepreneurial, or in a nonprofit or in a large corporation because they're filtering the um, facts and evidence through a different lens that hopefully makes them a more critical person in the sense of not accepting everything that's handed to them, but question at a high level, what is the truth? And I think the goal of the course, frankly, is to accelerate the time to truth. And if we can do that, then we've accomplished a lot. Accelerate the time to truth. That's great. Jim, if you could speak to yourself, oh, sorry, did you say 2000? 2000, oh gosh, six Nine. years ago? Nine, maybe? Ten. Whenever, whenever it started. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could talk to yourself then, what advice would you give yourself as an instructor? Other than don't do it? <laughs> Other than uh, don't do it. Oh, okay. Um, 
I think some of the mistakes we made early on were the, were the lessons we had to learn by mistake, by making the mistakes, which is that we thought we were picking projects um, that we were often um, less patient with the learning process than we probably should have been. Uh, I don't think we appreciated early on the extraordinary value of the mentor relationship between instructor and mentor and mentor and team. Um, you know, within the cohort, there's actually, if it's eight teams, there's eight mentors and they are their own uh, self-support group um, <clears throat> trying to help each other. The, we've developed over time mentor materials to support a mentor in week four. These are the teams your teams are probably, the struggles your teams are probably going through. These are the things you as a mentor can look out for. So, um, you know, I think we tried to do a lot ourselves and didn't quite understand how to maximize the dynamics and the metrics between those optimal uh, ratios between mentors and teams and the number of, we had 10 teams in the first class. Frankly, in my opinion, that's too many. Um, I think eight, six to eight is ideal. If you have too few teams, you lose the cohort peer to peer critical mass. And if you have much more than 10 teams, depending on how long the actual class is, because I think it's critical teams reported every week, um, and you don't want to go longer than three hours. We do a three hour lab with a break in the middle. That's about eight teams worth. Um, and, and I wouldn't want to go much more than that personally, but Todd, you may have a different uh, perspective on that. Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing, nothing different than what you said. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> okay. Last question before I turn to a couple audience questions. Um, Jim, Todd, what resources do you recommend for <clears throat> instructors or TAs that are on the line with us right now? Um, <clears throat> sure, I'll take a stab at that. I think, I think one of Steve Blank's uh, generous legacies to the world of entrepreneurship and innovation are the, the gift he gave through Udacity and the lectures online. So however you might choose to experiment with this approach, um, having Steve's lecture as that spinal cord, that backbone, if you will, rather, is critical. Steve and Bob Dorf also wrote a great book called The Startup Owner's Manual that we use as part of our curriculum. Um, Alexander Osterwalder's two books, Business Model Generation and Value Proposition Design, are also pretty essential building blocks. Um, and, and frankly, I can't imagine going into an environment, even in the beginning, you know, we had some of those tools with us, the Canvas. Uh, we didn't have the, the, the video. We had Steve's lectures, which I think were, you know, really well thought out and orchestrated, and they've evolved over time as well. Um, and there's a ton of, you know, people on the phone are smarter than I am about what the latest, greatest articles and videos and other resources to complement this curriculum. But I think that, that those would be my primary DNA building blocks uh, that I wouldn't want to go out without. Um, Todd, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, no. I, the, the answer is I, every time I teach the course, either I use material I've used before, so that's not very helpful to your audience, or um, – I, uh, you know, I go online, and quite honestly, if you Google Business Model Canvas and Lee Launchpad and Steve Blank and Jim Hornthal, and you know, you just you get a lot of links that that you can extract information from. I, I guess the way to put it, this I think this might be helpful is, I don't use any one source. What I do is I skim what's available and I extract what I need for the particular course or cohort, depending on, on who they are. Um, the one thing that I use almost all the time, I mean, I can think of an exception or two for very, very short versions of the course, um, is Launchpad Central or, uh, I, I mean, there is no or really, just to try to keep track of what's going on. Because, you know, remember that there's a tremendous amount of information flowing towards me, towards the instructor in these courses. So, to put it in contrast, in the, in the entrepreneurship courses that I taught 10 years ago, I sent a lot of information towards the teams, but I didn't actually have to do anything with information that flowed back to me until the end of the course when I created business plans. Um, you know, in other courses, obviously, you get homework or something like that turned in. But in this course, there's just mountains of information that flows back towards the instructor. And keeping track of it's tricky. Jim alluded to, you know, 88 emails a week or whatever it was. Um, you need an organizing principle to keep track of what's going on. And frankly, a bunch of Central does an okay job of that, so that's my that's my go-to place for it. Um, beyond that, yeah, I mean the stuff Jim listed is great, and, and I use the web sort of in general Google mode to find things.
to their specific interests. Great. Thank you, Todd. And for everyone out there, I will be consolidating a list. And with the recording of this webinar, um, we can send you out a, some of the resources that were mentioned and other ones that were, were not yet mentioned. Um, OK, quickly, we have time for a couple of questions from our participants. Um, from Brady, Brandy Nagel, can we quickly define what round heels means, Jim? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I'm suggesting with the phrase round heels is willingness to try something different, willingness to be open to what the evidence is suggesting. You're convinced it's women 18 to 34. You've done eight interviews. No one cares. You know, maybe it's men 25 to 54. Are you willing to consider that possibility? And the quicker you're willing to consider that possibility, the rounder your heels. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question about um, where to recruit entrepreneurial leads from. Do we have any insights on recruitment of entrepreneurial leads? Entrepreneurial leads in a I core sense? In, in an I core setting, yes. Wow. Uh, Todd? <laughs> uh, boy. No, they're self identified, so I don't really know the answer to that. Recruiting an entrepreneurial lead? It, it tends to be the PI within their postdoc group to find that candidate, that man or woman, who is most able to get out of a building and be reasonably articulate and presentable to the world at large. Um, but that's a very i core focused question. I think there's probably uh, within the i core node community uh, some better answers to that. But you know, I, I also did want to mention one resource I forgot to is VentureWell, which is a nonprofit, does conduct a three-day course mm -hmm. on how to teach this course with the syllabus, the information, the resources. And we've seen a lot of folks that have gone through that course. It's highly rated. It's highly regarded. We have nothing to do with it. So we can shamelessly promote it without mm -hmm. feeling like we're selling something because we're not. Uh, but that is one way for the curious to immerse themselves and their panels of educators and teams and students that will be, um, I think, a longer lasting impact than what we're able to accomplish in the brief time we have today. Great, well, we are almost out of time. I want to thank all three of you um, for taking the time and sharing your insights. This was a really great discussion and I'm sure everyone in their offices learned a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Jim.